as you come to the meditation, bring an attitude of respect to what you're doing. After all, this is a noble truth, the path to the end of suffering. And as you follow the path, it ennobles you and makes you more of a true person as well. We live in a culture that tends to be very cynical about truth. We have more truthiness than truth. In other words, people are interested in giving an impression of being truthful, but not necessarily wanting to actually be true. That's what we see all around us. And we're trained to see everything in that way. And as for nobility, it's a word you hardly ever hear. It's like dignity. I told you that story about the Russian woman I met years back. It was a Sunday evening up in Irvine. In the course of the Dharma discussion, I mentioned the word dignity. And she came up afterwards and said, you know, all these years she's been to America. She had learned the word dignity in her English classes in Russia, but she'd never used an American her, <clears throat> never heard an American person use it. That's a very embarrassing thing. The same goes for the word noble. How many people do we talk about being noble in our culture? Our values seem to be going in a different direction. It's all about consuming. And there's very little nobility in consuming. The true nobility lies in having the opportunity to take something away from someone else and not doing it. Learning how to refrain from harm. And our society doesn't really seem to value that. It's a real shame. This is why practicing the Dharma is countercultural. Not only here, but all over the world. In India, when the Buddha was teaching, what he was teaching was going against the culture. In Thailand, when you go to the forest tradition, that's one of the first things that struck me about the forest of Johns. After having lived in Thai lay culture for a couple of years, I knew what that was like, but their culture was very different. Their attitudes, their values were very different. They were really noble people and very true people. It's because they had followed this path. So this is the path that ennobles you. This is the path that makes you true. So give it some respect. Pay close attention to the breath. Pay close attention to getting the mind to settle down and be with the breath. Any thought that comes up, no matter how interesting or enjoyable or alluring, you've got to say no right now. It's in your ability to say no, that no nobility lies, and also to stick with a no, that's where the truth lies. But it's not just saying no, you're saying yes to the experience of the breath and the body, and how you sense the breath energies in the body. They help you settle in so that you can see for yourself some of those states that are described in the texts, where you allow a sense of pleasure to permeate through the body. So that no part of the body is not touched by that sense of well-being. There may be little pains here and there, but don't pay them attention. Focus primary attention on the sens sensation of comfort that you're gaining here right now. Because it's a blameless comfort, it's a blameless pleasure. Again, something that makes the path noble. I was reading recently some scholars complaining that the Four Noble Truths are not really noble. After all, it's no, what's noble about craving? What's noble about suffering? And they're claiming that the Four Noble Truths aren't even really true for anybody but someone who has already awakened, which is a very peculiar statement because the Buddha teaches the truths as a path. It's how you get there to awakening. You take them on as right view. In other words, you don't know them for whether they're actually true or not, but you're going to test them. You're going to apply them to your life. And the act of doing that is a noble act. Seeing craving not as a friend, but as a cause of suffering, something to be abandoned, that's a noble act. Seeing the act of clinging to the aggregates not, is not 
a source of happiness or a source of who you really want to be, but seeing it as suffering, something to be comprehended so that you can abandon the cause. That's a noble act as well. When the mind has a good sense of the present moment, and how to stay with the present moment without letting other things get in the way, seeing that as something to be developed, that too is a noble act. So the truths really are noble. And John Sawat would always said, you know, look at the suffering of the mind as a noble truth, something that's really worth paying close attention to, trying to understand it. That's what's noble about the truth. In other words, if we just push the suffering away, that's just our ordinary way of dealing with suffering. Well, if we try to run away from the suffering, that's our normal way. There's nothing noble about that. As the Buddha said, rushing after sensual pleasures or going toward self-affliction, those are ignoble. Here we're trying to do something that lifts the mind above that, those two extremes. And in doing this, we become true. We really do stick with it. We really do try to comprehend suffering, and we get deeper and deeper into our understanding. When we see craving, we don't see it as our friend. And it's not only noble people who would see that craving is a problem. You know, since a householder went to ask the Buddha, what is this about suffering, the cause of suffering? Please explain it to me. And the Buddha says, okay, I'll explain it in terms of the present moment, not anything far away in the past or future. And he asked him about his wife, and he asked him about his son. He says, are there people in your hometown for whom, if you heard that they were imprisoned or fined or that they had died, that you would feel nothing at all? And he said, yes. And why is that? Because I have no craving for them, no desire for them. Now about someone like your wife or your son, if you heard that anything happened to them in that way, he said, it would be a total change in my life. Again, why is that? Oh, because I have craving for them. An ordinary, everyday person can see this. So it's not something only noble people can see. But to see how useful this is and where it can take you, that's something you confirm only with awakening, the first stage of awakening. But in the meantime, you take it as a guide. It's your right view. It hasn't been confirmed yet, but trying to use this as a guide so that you know what to try to comprehend, what to try to abandon, what to try to develop. Taking that on is an ennobling act. And this is how the truths are noble. And as the mind develops and you finally are able to abandon the craving, develop the path, it's what makes you true. So have some respect for these truths. They can teach you a lot. There is a lot to be learned from suffering. As I've said many times before, it's like a water hole out in the savanna. If you want to know about the animals in the savanna, you can just go to the water hole. And they're all going to come in the course of a day. Just be very quiet and stay there. It's the same with the mind. All the attitudes of the mind are going to come gathering around your pain and suffering. Your beliefs about the universe. If there's a God, well, why is God creating this suffering? If you have other beliefs, okay, that those will come into play. And the Buddha does teach you some values. I mean, this is what right view is all about. These are the conditions that help get us beyond conditioning. Those same scholars I was reading were talking about how you can't really get away from conditioning. Everybody's conditioning, so even awakening is conditioning, conditioned. Well, the path is a kind of conditioning. The Buddha has to condition you out of your other social conditioning through the path. But once the path has done its job, okay, you put it aside. That's what the simile of the raft is all about. 
we're not here just to confirm right view. We use right view to take us beyond it. It's like the Buddha's instructions on how to go to a city. We follow the instructions, we confirm them for ourselves, but we're not there just to learn about the, the route. We want to actually get to the city at the end of the route. So these are means to an end, but they're means to a noble end, which means that they're noble as well. They ennoble us. They make us noble and they make us true, which is why we call them noble truths. 